Good afternoon and welcome to our final Institute for Sustainable Futures Keel Green Festival session. Uh, today we are really pleased to welcome Professor Claire Holdsworth, who is a Professor of Social Geography in the School of Geography, Geology and the Environment at Keel University, and is also a recipient of the Leverhulme Trust Major Research Fellowship, The Social Life of Business in an Age of Acceleration. Today, Claire will be exploring her project Bedding into Bags, which is an upcycling project to remake unused domestic textiles into new bags. The case study explores the ethics of upcycling and makes a case for upcycling to be interpreted as doing making forwards. This means starting with the potential of material rather than the goal of making end products. And the case study also explores how upcycling combines new and old materials to maximise the utility of unwanted fabric. Thanks very much, Claire, over to you. Thank you. So I will start off by sharing my screen. So I'm going to start off with an apology that I'm going to be reading a script for this afternoon. It's not my usual presentation style, uh, but I'm finding it harder to be spontaneous online. So I've now adopted the practice of writing scripts for presentations. So I'm going to start off with, uh, by introducing the context of the case study. and I'm really going to be repeating what Sarah's all, all already said. So I've completed the, the Bedding into Bags project as part of the Leafy Hume Trust Major Research Fellowship called the Social Life of Business in the Age of Deacceleration. And I apologise for missing the D out of the title um, uh, which, that I sent to Sarah. This project on upcycling ties together my interest in how we spend time and the relationship between productive and non-productive events and practices within a broad with, 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 within broader interests in debates about the quality of how time is spent, particularly in relation to sustainable practices. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is I'm going to start with a brief introduction to fabric upcycling, then introduce the bedding into bags project and discuss what I have learned from this project in, in relation to the ethics of upcycling and how time is spent in the practice of making. So uh, to begin with a, uh, a brief introduction to fabric upcycling. Fabric upcycling can be defined as remodeling old materials into new forms so that the value of, of, of the new product is greater than the sum of its original components. It is becoming increasingly popular as an alternative to sewing with new fabric and some of you might be familiar with the Great British Sewing Bees Transformation Challenge. Upcycling is practiced within the clothing industry, mostly by small scale manufacturers who make one off and bespoke items. However, it, also, it is also possible to purchase upcycled items from mainstream fashion outlets. And the picture here is a skirt that I have, ups, I have upcycled from a pair of jeans. And all the images I'm going to be showing this afternoon are all items that I've made or pictures from my craft space. So. It is possible though to discern a particular aesthetic to upcycling. Not only is it bespoke, but it is often promoted as a quick and easy alternative to making an item from scratch. So when, I, when I'm searching the internet for, 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 for ideas, I'm, I've been really struck by how often when, I'm, when I find an upcycling idea, it is promoted as this is something you can do quickly and this is something you can do easily. So I'm kind of really interested in, 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 in kind of thinking through about how important time is uh, to the processes of upcycling and really to sort of challenge this kind of normative aesthetic about, about it being quick and simple. Despite its growing pop popularity, there is very limited academic study of upcycling. Indeed, in studies of craft and making, sewing, particularly dressmaking, is somewhat overlooked. So my study is addressing this gap in the literature. I should also say that academic interest in upcycling tends to take a larger scale and, and, and focus on its potential for industrial processes. And some of you might be familiar with McDonoghue's and Braungart's promotion of cradle to cradle processes. I would like to argue that there is validity in exploring upcycling as an everyday practice. And a note on this, I find that upcycling or, or remaking is often missed out in studies of, of materiality or making. For example, I've just been reading Sophie Woodward, Woodward's Material Methods book, and she lists the following activities that can be done with things. She, she writes that they can be made, sold, bought, acquired, consumed, used, owned, stored, discarded or recycled. Um, there is no mention of remaking or upcycling, which I find a rather curious omission. 
This is, I suggest, a rather narrow interpretation of materiality that treats objects as static things, while upcycling starts with the potential of stuff. So I'm going to say a little bit about ethics and my kind of uh, theoretical conceptualization. So I'm particularly interested in exploring the ethics of upcycling and what we can learn about broader approaches to sustainability from the practices of fabric upcycling. So here I'm going to define my, my approach to understanding the ethics of upcycling. I argue that it's important to move beyond normative interpretations. I'm inspired here by writers such as Clive Barnett and Sarah Hall, who have written about the ethics of consumption. They argue that rather than ascribing some forms of consumption as ethical and others as not, it is more appropriate to explore orientations to ethics in all practices of consumption. So we, we, so we, we should be looking at the ethics of practices of consumption rather than making judgments between different choices. Following this approach, rather than ascribing ethical descriptors to, uh, to upcycling, for example, that it conforms to green ideals or the principles of the slow movement, I consider how upcycling can nurture an ethic of making. In other words, I'm not therefore trying to define upcycling as a green or slow practice. For me, upcycling is about a commitment to an external ethic. So it's not about a commitment to an external ethic, but an orientation to the potential of material. So building on, on this approach, my study of upcycling fits into a broader the theoretical in interest that I have in non-teleological interpretation. So non-teleology disputes the principles of teleology, that is that the ends defines the means. In other words, from a not from a teleological perspective, it matters less what you do compared to the end product of action. So non teleology rejects the importance of outcomes over practice and is very and is therefore very relevant to studies of making and indeed of upcycling. One way that we can develop a non teleological uh, orientation to upcycling is to think about the potential of what can be done with the material to hand rather than having the ambition to make a particular item. This focus on working with materials rather than the goal of making al aligns with the anthropologist Tim Ingold's very influential writings on making and his insistence that making should be done forwards rather than backwards. That is, we move forward starting with material rather than moving backwards from the goal of making a particular item. However, this is not to say that end products do not matter. Non-teleology does not reject the importance of the telos, but it encourages us to think about the intention of what we do with materials, rather than, rather than just focusing on end goals. A final point on theory is that I'm also interested in thinking about time as a material. It's not just fabric that I'm working with, I'm also remaking in time. And this idea draws on Karen Barrard's theorization of new materialism. She defines matter as relational, that it is, is not a thing, but a doing. I suggest that the practice of remaking, the, 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 in the practice of remaking, the relational properties of matter are knitted together in time. And, I'm paying, and therefore I'm paying particular attention to the temporality of remaking. Another way of thinking about time as material is to explore the life histories of materials, things, makers, recipients, tools, etc., and how these are in how these are interrelated. So, just to illustrate this last point with a concrete example, uh, one particular form of upcycling that I've been doing a lot of recently is memorial remaking. That is remaking the belongings of loved ones, the the the, the belongings of loved ones into new things. And the example that I have here is a dog I made for a friend for her mother who was in a nursing home and has therefore been isolated from her family for the last year. The dog is made from my friend's top and it's a small gesture of consolidating intimate relationships that have been fractured over this last year of separation and isolation. So we can read lots of life histories into this particular dog, the life histories of the materials and, and the life histories of um, of of the relationships that it captures. So I'm now going to move on to the practical side of this presentation and introduce the project I'm going to be talking about today, Bedding into Bags. 
For this project, I remade two duvet covers into eight bags. You're only going to see uh, the fabric from one duvet cover in the pictures as the second one, a plain red one, was used for the lining. All the bags have a different design and I'm going to introduce these in a minute. And I should say that I designed and made all and made all of the bags myself. So the methodology that, that I have used is auto F ethnography. That is, it's a self study of my own sewing practices to explore the materials, tools and skills of upcycling. I studied my own practice by making the bags, keeping a diary, filming and taking photographs and tracking time. I, I used an app on my phone uh, to time each sewing session. I have over 40 years of sewing experience, so I'm not an office sewer. And this is another novel element of my study as most existing um, autoethnographic studies of making are carried out from the perspectives of learning a new craft. For example, Erin O'Connor's written very influential papers on learning the skills of, of um, glass blowers. And other geographers have written about learning taxidermy or um, learning to become stone masons. I do not want to, to, to suggest that I did not learn anything from this project because I did, but I did not learn the basics of um, sewing. I also took myself out of my sewing comfort zone in this project. My established practice of sewing is more orientated towards sewing backwards. By this, I mean that I start with the ambition to make a particular item, a dress for a particular a occasion, for example, and then select fabric and a pattern to make um, um, to make this. In the Bedding into Bags project, I did not use any patterns. I challenged myself to work through all of the processes of making and design my own patterns and, and in so doing engage more, more fully with a forwards approach to making. So I'm now going to quickly introduce the bags that I have made. So first I made a basic bag made from material and thread with no additional materials. This is, this is a simple bag with a basic form. All the other bags that I've made have a more distinguishable form and have pockets and, and, and closures to enhance usability. These are, in the order that I made them, a shopper bag, a wash bag, a laptop case, a messenger bag, a holdall, a handbag, and finally, a backpack. And I'm going to focus briefly on three aspects of making the bags which contribute to my interpretation of the ethics of upcycling and how time is spent in the practice of making. So my first observation is about materials. I start with the potential of remaking redund redundant domestic textiles, but the process of remaking these into new bags requires the inputs of lots of other materials. If I had just made basic bags, that's the first one that I showed you, I could have reduced the input of new materials, but then I would have ended up with a large number of not very useful bags. So on this slide here, I've recorded all of the materials that I used in making the bags. I also took a photograph at the beginning of the project where I tried to capture everything that I thought I was going to use, and this is this photograph. I should say though, that at the beginning, I, I was not able to anticipate all of the materials and tools that I was going to use. So it's not a complete um, starring cast. But I do want to draw your attention to one material in particular, in our form interlining made by Bosal. This is the large roll of white fabric at the back of the photograph. This is a fusible foam material made from laminating polyurethane foam to a, to a napped tricot fabric. Using in our form greatly extends the form and functionality of the bags that I can make. The duvet cover material is a polycotton and quite lightweight. And by fusing the duvet cover fabric to in, all, to in our form, I can make bags with specific shapes. New materials therefore facilitate upcycling by expanding the range of items that can be remade. In our form, it's an excellent example of how material science is applied to upcycling and the potential for new materials to augment the capacity to remake old ones. My second observation is about working with machines and tools. Sewing requires working with a wide variety of tools, but in my upcycling project, it is mostly about working with my sewing machine, a FAF Quilt Ambition 630. So there were broadly two different types of sewing 
uh, machine that you can purchase. First are professional or industrial ones, which are designed to sew a few select stitches and withstand the continual use of factory production. Alternatively, domestic ones, which are lighter and more agile. Domestic machines such as mine can sew over a wide variety of different stitches. So the FAF can sew over 200 stitches and can be applied to different fabric and techniques by altering most of the settings. Sewing is not just about working with a machine. It is about anticipating the machine. Rather than thinking of the sewer and machine in unison, a sewer anticipates what the machine is going to do. And a very common cause of frustration is when this is, 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 is when you are not able to anticipate um, a sewing machine's actions. So while this might be a big con conceptual leap, I'm also inspired by Karen Ballard's writings about apparatuses as open ended practices. And I think it's useful to think about a sewing machine in this way. These are not fixed fix things that, that you operate, you work with and anticipate the machine. So working with a domestic machine is always a learning process, as each sewing project might require an adjustment. In making the bags, I had to learn how to sew bulky material, which I had created by fusing the duvet cuffer to in our form. The limitation of sewing with a domestic machine is that its versatility comes at the price of durability. These machines are made of lighter parts and cannot withstand heavy use. My machine temporarily stops working if I make it work too hard, and the following warning appears on, on its digital control panel. Machine needs to rest. Please wait a moment. The required uh, wait is very short. It's, it's less than a minute. But the machine installed pause instantly alters the temporal atmosphere of, of sewing. I usually find the warning amusing. My machine is telling me to take a break, and most of the time I respond with a smile, sit back and wait for the machine literally to cool down. On some occasions, I resent what I judge to be the machine's petulance. And rather than relaxing, the required pause intensifies the frustration of sewing. For example, the very final stage of sewing the last bag, the backpack, required binding the two main seams with bias tape. This entails sewing considerable bulk over a narrow seam allowance on a curved seam. When binding the first seam, the machine makes me wait three times, each time adding to my annoyance that the machine is not doing what I require it to do. However, for the second seam, I reassemble, I reassemble my orientation to the machine and the task at hand. I slow down the pace of sewing and through taking a steady approach, finish the binding with no interruption. The limits of the machine to do what I want requires a calibration of how I use the machine. The fault is not with the machine, rather how I use it. So my final observation is about time spent making, or more properly, the time spent making and not making. I've mentioned that one of the methods that I've used was to film myself sewing using my mobile phone. I was frustrated when I watched these films. I'm used to watching films off sewing as I often use YouTube videos to refresh or learn new techniques. But, but, but my films of my own sewing were nothing like these carefully edited videos. In my films, nothing happens for much of the time. The films capture me standing there, staring at the project in hand or constantly adjusting the fabric for cutting or the bag when sitting at the sewing machine. I seem to spend more time faffing around than getting on with sewing. My frustration on watching these films made me realise how important these moments of not doing are. Sewing involves very many different ways of making. During the project of making the bags, I am folding, unfolding, measuring, cutting, drawing, piecing, pinning, arning, pressing, fusing, quilting, basting, unpicking, finishing threads, winding bobbins, snipping, trimming and tidying. Fusing these different activities together is neither, is neither seamless nor linear. While the overall intention is towards completion of the bags, the process of making is uneven. This unevenness is experienced through varied intensity, times when nothing happens versus moments of intense doing or even reversal mistakes are unpicked and redone. So in my self study of sewing, I've therefore paid particular attention to times when I am not making 
and I've identified five main ways in which making is experienced through pause or reversal. So these are hesitation. These are necessary pauses for thinking through whether I am making the bags correctly. This is common at key moments, such as cutting the fabric and sewing major seams. Double checking that measurements are accurate and that pieces are pinned together correctly ensures the smooth um, 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 completion of the project. Preparation. This is similar to hesitation, but with more intention. This involves thinking through design, such as working out the correct size for each piece of, um, of the bags, and also thinking through process, that is thinking through what has to be done next. I should say that my commitment to not using pre-designed patterns and working out everything for myself, so this commitment to doing making forwards, has certainly intensified these moments of hesitation and preparation. So thirdly, repetition. Many stages of making the bags are redone or repeated. Fusing the foam into line into the fabric is done repeatedly if the fusing does not work first time. Piecing seams together is redone and hopefully reducing future undoing. Seams are reinforced or re-sewn along a straighter line. These repetitions and repeats facilitate the overall process of making and enhance the aesthetic of the finished bags. Undoing. Unpicking stitches is a core component of sewing. All sewers make mistakes. In making the bags, I sew zips in upside down, seams along the wrong line, twist handles, catch excess fabric and seams, miss seam allowances and insert piping incorrectly. All of these require unpicking and redoing, uh, sometimes more than once. Unpicking is inevitable, but it disrupts the atmosphere of the sewing space and my embodied experience of sewing. Unpicking deflates. I sit down sometimes on the floor to unpick. I should say that I, I sit down at, at my sewing machine, but all other stages of sewing, piecing, ironing, cutting, etc., I stand up. So unpicking is one of the very few stages of, of sewing that I sit down when I'm not at the sewing machine. But mistakes also, pro also provide a reason for, for, for stopping. Time to stop sewing, take a rest and return a fresh. Finally, organisation. The varied assemblages of tools and materials requires constant organisation. Everything has a place in my sewing room and I end each session by tidying up and putting everything away. During a sewing session, as more tools and materials are, are, are used, items are lost under fabric and the growing debris of rubbish comprising small offcuts from cutting out and the endless processes of trimming and clipping seams. Time is spent looking for items and continually rearranging the assemblages of materials and tools. So to wrap this talk up, in this talk I've explored the potential of fabric upcycling. I've suggested that upcycling should not be interpreted as an exemplar of green or slow making. Instead, what I have learned from making the bags is how to start with the potential of existing fabric and that material science it's also important in making up, up, upcycling possible. I've also learned to appreciate though, the slow temporalities of making. This is not about making in a particular way. It's not about adopting a slow um, normative ethic to sewing, but it's more about being alert to the uneven temporal rhythms of sewing. It's about how I sew with a machine and being attuned to how the machine works. It is also about appreciating the time spent weaving together different ways of making and not making. And I would argue there's a really important pedagogic element to this final point. I have taught sewing and other fabric crafts, and the biggest hurdle that I encounter when teaching um, sewing is frustration. The frustration that things do not come together in the way we anticipate. Even experienced sewers experience this frustration. And I suggest that in learning to sew, we should not just focus on the specific skills of sewing, but how sewing and other making practices are put together through different processes in a non-linear and non-teleological way. And I think we can really reflect on this observation during the pandemic. Uh, we've, we've all missed out on those pauses, those moments that we would normally encounter with our colleagues in corridors. So I think we've all learned to appreciate the non-linearity the non of, um, of, of, of doing. And I hopefully by making this very explicit through a study of, 
of making. You can think of how this observation between making and non-making is relevant to other aspects of academic life, particularly related to research and, and, and writing. So thanks for your time um, this afternoon. I've deliberately tried to keep it quite quite short. I didn't want to take up too much of everyone's time um, at this very busy time of, um, of year. If you are interested in finding out more about my sewing, I've just launched a new website called Threading Time, and I blog on there about the things that I'm making, other upcycling projects, and I also write quite a lot about memorial upmaking. So thank you. So that, was that was really, really fascinating, fascinating uh, exploration, exploration of your project. project. And, and I'd like, I'd to, like invite to invite people, people to um, unmute um, themselves, raise a hand if you've got any questions for the class. Could I perhaps start with a question about um, if people want to get into upcycling, do you think there's a particular level of skill that people need to have to have the confidence to um, to get into upcycling? And where would you advise people to start if they did want to um, do their first upcycling project? OK, upcycling doesn't have just to be sewing, I should say. So obviously I upcycle with fabric because I make with fabric. Um, and as I've already said, there is a very a kind of a dominant and aesthetic that it is that it is quick, that it is easy. I kind of have tried to challenge that a little bit because I don't think that it has to be. But if, for example, if you took the first one that I sh the first example that I showed you, which was a which was the skirt, which was made out of a pair of trousers, that's really a cutting out exercise and a little bit of sewing. So you're not having to fit a zip. You're not having to fit a waistband. You're not having to do those more structural um, um, components of 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 sewing. So a simple transformation around clothing is possibly an easier first step because rather than some of the I think some of the, the upcycling that I do around making particularly completely new items. So taking a duvet cover into a bag is clearly more actually more complex than turning a pair of trousers into um, um, into um, so a pair, a pair of trousers into a skirt uh, into a skirt. I've also do the, the the opposite. I can I turn trousers into dresses, um, which is slightly more and it's just slightly more involved because you do obviously have to fit a zip into that. Uh, but there's there's a lot of resources out, out, out there. I mean, I I think I've tried to stress I'm slightly uncomfortable about the idea that upcycling should necessarily be seen as something quick. Um, I recognize that it is a way of getting into sewing. Um, you don't have to be spend lots of money on buying new materials. And I think one of the reasons that people lack the confidence of material of, 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 of sewing is that you can spend quite a lot of money of material. And when you got it laid out, you got to make that first cut. That's quite challenging. So at least you're getting around some of those kinds of um, of um, of of issues. What I would though, recommend. So I talked a lot about my sewing machine. I really didn't give enough credit to my scissors. I could, I actually could could have talked about scissors. I have multiple pairs of scissors. They all have different uses. Some of them are really quite expensive, but it is, um, but one of the, the problems I think when people talk about, or oh, anyone can upcycle, because all you need to do is just take an old pair of jeans, you can turn it into X, Y, Z. You actually need the tools to do this. And one of the most basic tools you're going to need is a be decent pair of sewing scissors. You're not going to be able to do that kind of intricate cutting with a pair of kitchen kitchen scissors. So I we also have to recognize this is one of the things I'm trying to challenge a little bit is the assumption that upcycling is just about reusing. It isn't. You need other tools and other materials to make it possible. Yes. Yeah. So, Claire, thank you for your talk. Um, I honestly didn't know what to expect, and um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. I I was amused. I was also a bit nostalgic. So I grew up in a country, um, Afghanistan, uh, where I'd say up to seventy percent of our clothes were sewn, home sewn, by my mother, especially who was also a full time worker, teacher, and she hated it. <laughs> and uh, one. I mean, I became very nostalgic as you were talking because, um, you know, frustrations and, and she'd almost, she'd have this tendency to anthropomorphize the sewing machine, talk to it, negotiate with it. <laughs> um, and she also had this 
tendency of, you know, the, the item she was making for the specific person and she would just kind of say so she would always swear when she was making stuff for me because apparently I was stubborn and that was reflected then in that process of making but all of that childhood experiences aside one thing that struck me in your talk was that this upcycling or making uh, new things from old things combined with new materials in a way it kind of elicits talk or potential for talk. Um, and I was just trying to think about where does that come from? I mean, in a way, it's almost an opportunity for maybe intergenerational dialogue, um, or at least groups of people who are physically distant or temporally distant. Um, it, it, it generates curiosity. What was it that before? And, it reflects creativity. What did you make of it? But again, I go back to nostalgia as well. I mean, I think you have to reimagine what the item was originally. Anyway, this, and there's a theme of identity. As a social psychologist, of course, I'm, 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 I'm doomed not to think about identity. So I don't know. I don't even have a particular question. It's, these are the themes that came up as you were talking. I, if there's any way you can respond or reflect on that, I'd appreciate that. I, I really hear what what you're saying, and this is, of course, maybe one of the frustrations of actually doing this in lockdown, that it would have been great to be able to have those conversations. So you can see why I envisage the upcycling as a community project. I think it would have been great. I couldn't do that. I've had to do it by myself. Um, but I think more than the upcycling of the bags, which is a kind of a rather bit of a functional project, mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've, well, the advantage about that is I've been able, we'd be able to explore that from a 360 degree perspective because it's a little bit of a neutral project. But if you want to, to respond to your point, which is, I think you're really kind of confirming what I said about the life histories, but the life histories of not just materials. I'm thinking about really we have the opportunity to interweave. And I do like the fact that when I talk about making, I can use knitting, weaving, it, you know, sewing, and I can use those words with that kind of dual, dual, dual meaning so that we can interweave the life histories of materials, of objects. And mm. I also do want to put both materials processes and objects on an equal footing i think in a lot of the literature around making there's a big emphasis on it's what you do it's process that matters and i'm trying to also with upcycling think also uh, elevate the end product as well but to get to the point i'm going to make it really comes out with the memorial remaking that i'm doing i chose not to talk about that today i'm writing about it i'm blogging about it i can get slightly emotional so tomorrow's my father's birthday and he very sadly died in April last year. So probably didn't want to talk about memorial remaking today, but I've done an awful lot of it. I haven't just done it for my family. I've done it for friends. So I had a brief example of the dog that I did, which is a kind of an, a, an and that is those are that's a fantastic way of eliciting response. And I've just finished reading a book which has really, really helped me to make sense of this for the psychologists that have that have joined us. I've just finished reading The Crafting of Grief, um, which I've really enjoyed reading because it make this I this idea is that we can craft our own ways of responding to grief. We don't have to follow, you know, the five stages of grief. It also allows me it, it well, it, it kind of recognizes that we we don't have to break our relationships with people who have died and that's it's very very clear it's rejecting that so i found this book really really helpful and it makes an awful lot of sense with what i'm doing around remote around memorial remaking and you can imagine how those items have a huge potential to elicit stories and i do think that there's a so one of the papers i'm hoping to write is to sort of like take so this, this book's called the crafting of grief it's nothing about crafting but again it kind of you can understand how memorial remaking really kind of fits with that so that's a another paper but i find it um slightly um harder to talk about that in this kind of context um so that's why i chose to talk about the bedding into bags thank you so much alexandra um, I'm going to go because oh, thank you. <laughs> thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks, Claire. It was really interesting. I was just um, I was wondering, I've done, as you know, actually, I've done some work on knitting and some of the narratives around that in, in relation, not because I'm interested in crafting at all, actually. I'm, and I'm sorry about that. I'm the world's worst 
So uh, um, I, I don't know how to make things. And I'm always really super impressed with the creativity that you see when, when you be coming up with things like this. But one of the things in, in the knitting work that we did, we, we found a lot of this, the idea of passing things on and that the sort of nostalgia and the connections between people and all of that. Um, and I guess you've got that in quite a literal sense in your project with the, the, the fabric the actual physical nature of this um but i was just wondering people talked in our study about passing on the skills and the techniques um and i was wondering if there was any aspect of that that had featured into your project and then you know like how did you learn to to sew in the first place and and how does that fit in and then a second question is about um the same thing but to do with the equipment so i mean with knitting it's not so much of a big deal the equipment but you talked about your machine in quite a you know it's an important part of this so is there a sense that you feel that the that, is there any kind of passing on of equipment going on here as well um okay so uh, the original idea of the project would have been i would have used upcycling as a way of teaching sewing couldn't do that because i was going to do it last summer and i can't teach sewing in a socially distanced way i wasn't even going to go and try it I, I it was just um there is teaching craft for me is is such an embodied process because I've taught I have taught sewing and I have taught crochet and I, I know how that it, it there's often a physical intimacy to it so I actually made the decision I wasn't going to do it it'd be nice I've obviously had to finish my fellowship I, I had the time so it'd be, maybe would it be nice to go back and try and redo this another time because it doesn't take an awful lot of money what it takes is my time um so unfortunately I couldn't have that component of it in the project and that's that's I've had to put on one side. So to ask, um, so to respond to what you, I mean, I, I, I learned at school, um, but I do come from a family of sewers. My grandmother was a was it was a was a brilliant sewer. Not so much my mother, she won't mind me saying that. Um, but but so I, I had that kind of legacy in my family. And one response I know that people might have, because I really learned to sew, I went to I went to a girls grammar school and we we only did two. Um, we, 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 we either did we spent six months doing textiles, six months doing um, 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 doing cookery. We didn't do anything else. No woodwork, no metalwork, no design technology, girls grammar school. And when I tell a lot of people this, it's oh, this is it's, it's so sad that other people don't get to learn to sew at school like you did. And my response is. I don't know because I'm the only person that I know of from that generation who's still sewing. So all of that, all of that effort that schools put into teaching, I'm not, I'm not convinced that schools are the place to do it. I was just fortunate that I had that inclination, and school was where I learned. But I would have learned anyway if it wasn't at school, and I would have learned through that generational process. Um, and and I th and so it's real frustrating that I haven't had that opportunity with this particular project to pass it on. The sewing machine, I am very precious about my sewing machine. Unlike other sewers, I only sew with one. I know other people have lots of multiple sewing machines and they like acquiring them. And there's this sort of like this, it's almost like the stuff that you collect. I might be an upcycler, but I'm also rather ruthless. So I'm always I'm always thinking through what can I do to get rid of stuff. So one of the last projects I did was I made a whole load of yoga bolsters out of fabric that was left over. And I kind of gave them away for in exchange for a charity donation, because one of the limitations of upcycling, if you're never going to throw anything away, you can just become a hoarder. And I think there is a balance between what we think about stuff. The idea is, is that I have to think about stuff being useful. And so for me, I only have one sewing machine. I do have others and my mother's given me one and I do have access to them. Uh, I confess I managed to convince the Levy Hume Trust to buy me a sewing machine, <laughs> which um, which means I've got a rather nice one now. Um, they they did agree to this purchase um, and I am going to be doing an exhibition, hopefully, hopefully this summer. So you get an opportunity to see the bags. Um, hopefully it's going to be in the in the new exhibition space in the cafe so it's going to be there in the summer assuming campus is open fingers crossed where you have an opportunity to see that so that's why i managed to negotiate a sewing machine with them um, um from them so i'm in a rather fortunate position uh but i know i'm quite also you 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 unique that i just like to have 
a very yeah I'm, I'm very faithful to my sewing machine yeah i'm like Massey says i'm anthropomorphizing my relationship with a <laughs> with, with with my sewing machine and we all do it that's really interesting thanks i'm going to see another parallel there with my uh, musical instruments projects we've been looking at people donating their unwanted instruments and um, some people have that sense of you know i can't possibly give this away it's like a you know personal friend and other people have got tons and so yeah lots of parallels there thank you hi that was a lovely uh, presentation um so sort of one of the issues i feel like for the younger generation to get into this um, is the fact that obviously you need a lot of patience, sort of like you had, um, like you had explained in your in your presentation. Um, and I, I I almost feel that in sort of the digitalized age with you know computer games and sort of high dopamine sort of release, um, uh, you know. Uh, programs that are shortening people's attention spans I almost feel that that's you know it's um it's shortening the you know the time for children to to learn these skills um and potentially upcycle um one of the things uh I one of the ways maybe I see this being sort of a uh, um solved would possibly be running some sort of um uh apprenticeship scheme in sort of like an upcycle hub where you know young people are um collaborating with you know um more you know skilled um craftsmen craftspeople sorry um to um you know to to learn this stuff um and possibly maybe you know there be some sort of scheme where i don't know there there is some other incentives there to do this because you know we really it'd be really good to have this uh this, this knowledge um you know uh, this this um knowledge transfer down the you know down the generations but i i personally don't see that happening at the minute um so yeah is there any um what what would you say is um do, do you see this happening or do you see or do you see it sort of going in in down in in other ways so yeah okay thanks that's a really in interesting question so um one thing I would respond to that I'm going to I'm going to slightly defend computer games. My daughter's not a sewer; she's a gamer. You actually need quite a lot of patience to play computer games. I've got no patience when it comes to computer games. I have a much more patience when it comes to sewing. I kind of want to rescue computer games a little bit of that because I've seen how my daughter survived lockdown through Animal Crossing, and I think a lot of people might recognise that. And so I know Alex has done work on 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 well-being and activities, and I think we can sort of widen out the breach. But I am going to respond though to exactly what what um to what 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 you're saying about how do we teach how do we how do we how do we develop the skills in, in, in office and i think you're making a very very relevant point here and in some ways it responds to what alex said so when alex asked me how did i learn and i said well i learned in school but i don't think that is the solution and i don't think that it is so last year um last academic year uh, before covid hit i was involved in the student union craft a noons in that, but those particular afternoons, I was only teaching crochet. I wasn't teaching sewing. Um, that's partly a resource issue. One of the problems we have with particularly teaching sewing is, I mean, you say it's about time and patience. I was expecting you to say it's about space uh, because one of the things you need for sewing is space. So one of the reasons that I choose when I'm teaching young people to head more down the crochet line is because it's literally all I need is yarn and a hook. I don't need I don't need the the um, space. So I'm very fortunate where I am in my life history that I've managed to create in my home a sewing space. And that's a really, really important factor that you have to consider is that when you're looking at sewing, it doesn't just require time, it requires space It's a very important resource. So, but what I did learn in doing the Craftanoons, I learned a lot about how to teach because uh, what really worked in the afternoons was that it was a very casual invitation. So we'd go along on a Friday afternoon, sit in the student union space, and I'd just sit there with a hook and a yarn and wait for people to turn up. When I first started teaching crochet, I got it all wrong. I ran workshops. I said, you're going to be there at two o'clock and I'm going to be there. And I, I, I did everything right, I thought. I had my intended learning outcomes. I had written out all the instructions. I followed everything that academics had told me. This is how I teach. I didn't teach anyone crochet. 
when I did the afternoons, I just sat there waiting. I had no, 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 no plans, no ideas. It was just like students want to come and learn, come and sit down by me. And this is the problem. My teaching really needed me to sit down next to someone. And that's why I haven't been able to do it during lockdown. Um, sit down next to me and I can just show because all craft, all learning crafting, and I think we can recognize this in, in our academic work as well, requires a person centered approach. And I had to learn to really develop a person centered approach to teach crochet. And the same is true for sewing. Mm -hmm. So I know how I would do it. I would love to be able to have a, an open space with sewing machines where I could go and just sit and be available to help and that's how you would do it but that requires investment of 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 tools it requires investment of space as well as investment in time and that's so I I kind of do know I think I do have in my mind a way that I could respond to what you're saying uh, because what I really learned is that the value of the casual invitation to come along to sit down to learn was far more valuable than you're going to be there at two o'clock and I'm going to give you a handout and you're going to learn how to crochet. That didn't work. So that's what we need to think about. Um, but you can imagine how result, you know, who's who's going to give anyone the resources to have a have a have a sewing machine space. And that's only going to be made available where you've got a large number of people. So you're only probably going to find this in an urban centre. I mean, so those those are the things that we need to think about. So thank you very much for your question. It's something that I'm I really would like actually to be doing more teaching. I'm a little bit frustrated that I'm doing auto ethnography because uh, it's not really what I wanted to do. But I just hope the value of the auto ethnography is that I can actually kind of strengthen the, the observations that I had from teaching crochet about the importance of the kind of non-linearity and the importance of dealing with the frustration of learning. That's a really interesting response. Thank you. I mean, sort of what inspired my um, my question really was um, sort of local to, uh, near to me um, in a place called Paynton, um, uh, back home in Devon. Um, they have they have a an upcycling sort of um, an up, upcycling hub that's just beginning. <laughs> Um, and they are trying to sort of, you know, have a space there where there is space and there is the resources um, and, you know, and, and people there to teach. Um, I mean, one of the issues that I can see might be happening from that response there that you've given is possibly, you know, it's, it's almost too formal there. So people actually attending, um, there's a bit of a barrier for, you know, someone like me to, to, to go off and, and learn some of that. So, yeah, I'd, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one. But um, and it also like, you know, I feel there's there's probably some sort of social economic disparity there because, you know, for the, for those that can mend their stuff and, um, you know, and, and, are, and are crafty, you know, you can make things last longer. But unfortunately, you know, this requires, um, you know, quite substantial sort of, um, uh, well, not <laughs> It depends how you go about it but you know it might require quite a lot of sort of you know money to get to get the stuff um you know to initially purchase the stuff and like you were saying about space it's really interesting so those communities that kind of almost need need it most because it would really help them out um you know aren't able to sort of establish that which yeah is so but, but painting itself is actually quite um you know it's not it's not a particularly uh, well-off region so i, I I kind of understand why they're, you know, they're why they're doing it, possibly to, you know, to to drive that um, initial uh, incentive. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's be it, it could be too institutionalised. And yeah, that's a really interesting response. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I would also yes, yeah, sewing is white and middle class, and that is one of the barriers that that uh, that's one of the barriers that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you could probably just hear, hear my doorbell going then. Oh. Uh, Matthew, did you have another question? I do, but I also appreciate that I've already asked. And if you want to get the door, maybe it's... Can I? Can I? Yes, of course. <laughs> Post. 
Thank you. Right. It happens to me all the time during teaching, so that's totally fine. Um, so I appreciate the other people. If they have a question, please go ahead. I can find other space and time to ask my question. If not, I do have. So there's okay. Um, Claire, uh, I'm currently doing with our master's students um, in applied social and political psychology and action research, which is part of their program. Um, and they're just kind of going to go around uh, campus, talk to different people, staff, students, management, what about the purpose of university? What did they have in mind coming to university and what's happened? What's been their experience and so forth? And, it's, uh, and of course, they've started with themselves. But what you've just demonstrated, but also just kind of the, the lack of resources. And I think this project, again, I, I came to this talk expecting absolutely nothing. And yet I can see to a lot of utility, even in the way we teach. We teach in a very boring, abstract ways that's probably borrowed from the Middle Ages. And, you know, you know I can totally imagine and reimagine how we teach basic concepts in social psychology through this kind of exercise. So in a way, I don't know, I guess my invitation to you, and I might actually ask my students to contact you and talk about your experiences, is can we reimagine the learning space across our campuses where, you know, at least spaces are created and they're not just, oh, this is an activity on a Friday afternoon, but actually, and I mean, I'm also one of what you were saying reminds me a lot of the philosophy of the uh, Steiner School, um, if you're familiar with this. So, you know, this is how they learn. Um, you know, they learn about chemistry, not inside a lab, but actually in the woods. So I don't know to what extent there's also a sociology or, or social geography of reimagining the learning spaces. Um, that's one question. And the other thing, if you do have any yoga posters, please, I'm, I'm a very good <laughs> taker. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I've, I've, I'm just about, I think I'm going to take another load of, um, of, of fabric. So I, I might, I might be making a few more. Yes, yeah, so it was, uh, it was really, it was, it's the ultimate stash busting activity. Um, I, my one concern about opening up the campus, I mean, the, the afternoon space worked really well. It was a very welcoming space. And what certainly we noticed was was how we actually were able to rec um, in, in, in invite an inclusive group of students. It was it was actually it was nice for me that I wasn't just teaching people to crochet who look like me. Put it like this, okay? Um, um, but there was a few things that that they got wrong with it because they thought so. The students' union thought as we were doing craft, we needed a craftsy table, so they they gave us a wooden bench that got encrusted with yarn and food, and they gave us no no and then we sat at a bench so we had no support so there were lots of things that there were some things that they got wrong but an open space to come and sit down and learn was really valuable the limitation of doing that was that it's incredibly time intensive to do this and we realized that is not the resource we're going to have a lot of so it's great for me to go along when i'm on a fellowship for two hours on a friday and say right i'm here and to be able to write up my experiences of doing person-centered learning and to be that and, 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 and for that to be a useful exercise and therefore not just to be about my fellowship but therefore be the benefits of me spending my time for other people but how do we democratize that how do we make that available how do we open up our spaces of learning to be these kind of very open non-bounded because we can we can Normally, I are, when I talk about time management, I normally say it's the management of space, not the management of time that matters. But in this regard, I'm going to go in the opposite and say, yes, we can do the spatial transformations. We can we can create um, more open learning spaces. I mean, I know we do. We tend to have. a. I know we, 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 we probably have too many. I know that the, the university is based around a series of shut off rooms and lecture theatres and, and I know we've got a long way to move on from that but I'm pretty certain as the university does eventually over time invest in the campus etc we're going to see we are going to see this shift towards more open open non non-bounded learning space but our problem is going to be around the time it's incredibly intensive 
of the person who's doing the teaching to teach in that way. And that's the question that we, how do we democratize person-centered learning is, is the challenge that, um, um, that we face. For, for, for teaching something like crochet, which is basically only teaching a small number of techniques, I can do it. For teaching human geography, I, I, can, I can see that there are more challenges there. I appreciate that. And I think maybe just a mix of both. Now, I wasn't suggesting that this is the only way to do that. But what, what resonates with me as well is the importance of time, whether it's writing a grant application, a solid good grant application that has some chance of success or running a good teaching session. You know, space is just as important as actually time. I mean, you know, I don't think that's really valued or appreciated at the moment, but that's I'm ranting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, well, we're, we're pretty much at, at three o'clock. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Claire for a really fascinating talk and the Q&A afterwards. Thank you to everybody for your questions and for um, the ongoing debate afterwards. Um, and I think one of the things that we do really miss is being able to do that round of applause in person. So, you know, we've got our little icon that we can do. And, you know, if our cameras are on, uh, like Massey giving a, a clap, but, uh, but yeah, thank you so much, Claire. It's been a really fascinating session um, and great to, to have people from around the university coming along to, um, to learn about the project. Yeah, thank you.